Hey guys, welcome back for today's lecture on May 7th, Thursday. Uh, today we're going to cover some of the craziest events in the last 40, 50 years uh, in our nation's history. Some uh, huge scandals that are unlike any other. Uh, so yesterday we talked about the Camp David Accords with Israel and Egypt, and then we talked about the Iranian Revolution and the Iranian hostage crisis. And I mentioned, I talked a little bit already yesterday about the Iran-Iraq war. Um, but today we're gonna start with that so to go over it quickly again, uh, Iraq, er, excuse me, Iran had at that point established themselves as the most powerful country in the Arab world. It was Egypt, but then Egypt falls out of favor because, you know, they make the rest of the Arab world mad when they try speaking for the rest of them at the Camp David Accords. So Iran rises to power with Ayatollah Khomeini. Uh, then the U.S. places all these sanctions on Iran after, you know, they overthrow the American favored government and then take 54 or 55 hostages. Uh, so we place all these embargoes and trade bans on them. So Iraq sees this as a chance for themselves to crawl up and become and knock off the powerful Arab country and become top dog themselves. So they invade Iran and it's a back and forth, uh, battle for the next eight, nine years that neither side wins. And the U S originally sells weapons and helps Iraq. Now the U S didn't have any ties to Iraq. We had no diplomatic affairs, uh, or relationships with them, but we really despised Iran, so we we're like, yeah, we'll help their enemy. And in doing so, we helped Saddam Hussein. But over time, we started to realize, hey, this Saddam Hussein guy sucks too. We don't like him either. And there are American diplomats that were quoted as saying, like, it's a shame they both, they can't both lose. Like that's, that's just how we felt watching this unfold. And the U.S. ends up actually selling weapons to both sides over the course of this war. And that seems strange and maybe like a conflict of interest. But again, it wasn't really interest at all. We didn't really care too much either way by the end of the war who won. Uh, we just saw it as an economic opportunity. Now, there was more to it than that. There's more than just an economic opportunity, and I'll talk about that here in a moment. But first, let's shift into Central America with the country of Nicaragua. You're going to think, wow, that's clear on the other side of the globe. That surely has nothing to do with Iran or Iraq. Well, you're wrong. So Nicaragua had a, I don't know what you call it. Um, it was a dynasty in power. Like a, it was almost like a monarch, but they didn't call themselves kings. But it was a family that had ruled Nicaragua for the last 50, 60 years called the Somozas. And the Somozas, while they had a decent relationship with America, like they were for the most part capitalist and we enjoyed trade with them, uh, they they were sneaky, dirty people. They murdered, tortured, uh, arrested a lot of people for unjustified reasons uh, and committed terrible offenses. Even when a uh, an earthquake of like a 6.2 magnitude, which is very, very big, uh, hits their capital city and destroys it, all this international aid and money comes in 
and the Somoza government like pockets it. Like they they were swindling money and it was just a bad deal all around. And finally, by the end of it, like the people had gotten so sick of it, there were some uprisings. Finally, the Carter, Jimmy Carter administration, even they said, look, we can't back you now. We're not, we're cutting ties. We can't back a government that's as hated and disgusting as you guys are. So when they cut ties, a rebel group in Nicaragua known as the Sandinistas rises to power. The Sandinistas are a leftist Marxist group, meaning they were, they had communist back, uh, communist backgrounds. Now they were actually more socialist necessarily, but we really didn't care. We didn't like either of those things. They were followers of Cuba, Castro specifically. And so the Sandinistas rise to power. They uh, execute the Somoza head of government and then rise to power themselves. Um, and a rebel group against them rises out of this called the Contras, which is short for Contra Revolucion Revolucionaries. I can't speak Hispanic. Um, which just means counter-revolutionary. So they were countering the original revolution. Now the Contras uh, didn't support Marxism or communism or socialism, any of that. And the U.S. is like, hey, we like you guys. That sounds great. We're fighting the same fight. So the U.S. helps the Contras. Like they send them weapons and money. Uh, but the Contras are not good people they committed atrocities rape and murder and intimidation now the sandinistas were doing this were doing similar things too they were no uh, angel government but the u.s when choosing between two evils chooses the non-socialist one as always well the people back in America didn't support this. They said, we need to stop getting involved in other people's business, especially when it's a no-win situation, such as it was in Nicaragua. Like, neither of these governments are fit to lead the people, and it's not our business anyways. So then government follows suit, and the Boland Amendment is passed in 1985, which just says that the U.S. cannot directly assist the Contras in defeating the Sandinistas. We cannot give them money. So you would think uh, event over, no more worry about the Contras, whatever happens down there happens. Well, you're wrong. And says President Reagan. Reagan was uh, a very right-wing conservative, very anti-communism. Uh, and the people that he put in power in his cabinet were very well the same way. Well, this starts the Iran-Contra affair. So somehow we managed to tie Iran and Nicaragua together. And how we do this is after the Bullet Amendment, where we couldn't just openly send money and weapons to the Contras. We decided, well, we can't send money on the books. So it has to be basically unmarked money. Money that we didn't, that no one would know we would have. And when I say we, I mean like the people or, uh, you know, America, whatever American government accountants, maybe bal budget balancers, have you. Um, so what we do is we decide, hey, let's take some of the money that we're making by dealing weapons in the Iran-Iraq war. We thought, well, everything we're selling Iraq is government mandated, like we were supporting Iraq. So uh, everything that all the money we got back from Iraq for those weapons, we were 
you know, reporting in our own government checkbook, basically. But we could sell, we could secretly and illegally sell weapons to Iran and then use that money to fund the Contras. It would never be recorded. It wouldn't be in our checkbook. Um, that's that theory in economics is known as fraud. I believe specifically wire fraud. Basically moving money that is not accounted for in any kind of uh, any kind of account. Um, but we knew, well, we hate Iran, so we can't just tap them on the shoulder and say, hey, you guys want to buy these guns? So we decided, hey, let's find a co somewhat common ally. Well, Israel wasn't currently at war with Iran, so we thought, here's an idea. How about we sell weapons to Israel? Israel then sells those weapons to Iran. And then Iran gives the money to Israel, and then Israel gives the money to us. That way, if it does go on the books, it's just a loan to our friendly ally, Israel. No one would bat an eye at it. So that's what happens. Selling money, or not selling money, selling weapons to Iran, and taking that money, not accounting for it at all, and sending it to the Contras, which not only violated the law, it violated an amendment. It violated the Boland Amendment. Like, we put a rule in the book specifically to stop funding the Contras, and we went around it. Now, the person in charge of this was Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North, who was very high up in President Reagan's cabinet and very trusted by Reagan. Uh, when this affair comes to the public, People are appalled and upset. Um, and Oliver North takes all the blame. Reagan doesn't get, I mean, he, he claims ignorance. He claims he did not know that that was going on. And there's never been any pr direct proof that he did. So he maintained ignorance. So... In this case, Reagan, at worst, was breaking openly breaking the law. At best, he didn't have enough power or control on his own uh, support staff that they were going rogue and doing things that he didn't allow. Um, and and Reagan's a he's a controversial figure in in conservative areas. He's loved. Like, Kansas is a big Reagan state. My parents absolutely adore Ronald Reagan. I could see why. If you ever, if you listen to Ronald Reagan talk for a couple minutes, like, he is a very likable individual. He is hilarious. If you have time, YouTube Reagan jokes, because he is absolutely hysterical, to me anyways, in a goofy grandpa kind of way. Um... But he had some controversy with him. You know, like liberals do not like him. Democrats do not like him. He was, um, he was very conservative. But this was, this is probably the biggest stain on his record as president is the Iran-Contra affair. So now we get to we get back to the U.S. and the Soviet Union. Uh, Reagan labels the Soviet Union as the evil empire. Um, he tries to install a defense system known as a strategic defense system, and it becomes known as Star Wars, and for two reasons. One, because the actual plan itself was in order to possibly eliminate a threat of being hit by a Soviet nuclear missile. We were going to put satellites up in, not satellites, sorry, lasers up in space that would sense when a missile was shot off 
and the lasers would just shoot these missiles as soon as they left the ground, meaning they would detonate and explode over the Soviet Union and not over the US. So it was, now we're taking war, nuclear war specifically, into space. So we call it Star Wars. Also, this idea comes out like right after the first Star Wars movie. So it was a big hit and it was fresh in people's minds. But the second reason we called it Star Wars was because like the movie, this was not realistic whatsoever. Like this was a dream. This was a crazy dream type thing. At the time, we were 14 years removed from landing on the moon, and we thought the possibilities were endless, so I could kind of understand, like, dreaming big. But looking back on it, it was a ridiculous plan. Like, it was never going to happen. Um, but, yeah, that was Star Wars, was the plan to put lasers up into space to shoot out any missiles that might be launched. Now, tension starts to increase throughout Soviet Union, Eastern Russia, and then Berlin, specifically. Ronald Reagan makes a trip to West Berlin, and he gives a speech right next to the wall at the Brandenburg Gate, which was the main opening of the gate which it hadn't been opened in a long time but he gives a speech and it's a really good speech but his most famous quote is he tells the soviet leader mikhail gorbachev mr gorbachev tear down this wall and the crowd roars and there's people on the other side of the wall in east berlin that hear the message that cheer um and Gorbachev eventually listens. Now, Gorbachev is, we talked a little bit last year about him. He's so different from every other Soviet leader. He is very calm, understanding, um, sympathetic, and he sees the need for reforms because, as you see with communism, after 60 years, which is what the Soviet Union was going on, Communism starts to break down. When you run out of money in the economy, and communism doesn't make money, when you run out of money, you are screwed. So Gorbachev tries to reform not just the government, but also, or not just the economy, but also the government and the social atmosphere in the Soviet Union. So economically, he introduces the concept of perestroika, which was gradual, gradual capitalist reforms. He was gonna take some of the economic power away from the government and place it back into the people's hands. Not all, he wasn't gonna just flip completely and go capitalist, but he was gonna slowly transition that way. And then he was gonna implement glasnost, which just means openness. He was going to take off so much of the oppression so much of the silence that had been forced on the people. You know, he's going to he's going to give freedom of press. He was going to give freedom of media, freedom of speech, something that the Soviets hadn't had. And when that happens, you're going to see people use it. You're going to see people criticize. And you're probably after this long of the Soviet Union struggling, you're probably going to see the people rise up and go against you. And that's ultimately what ends up happening. Uh, but Gorbachev and Reagan are actually, or become good friends after this. They're actually kind of during it. Like they, no American and Soviet leaders were anything even close to as friendly with each other as Reagan and Gorbachev. I think 20 years before with Khrushchev and Kennedy and how they hated each other. Now, now look at Gorbachev and Reagan friendly like i think they even played golf together after their terms as leaders like in the 90s um yeah that's that's where we're headed we are headed to the collapse of the soviet union so today's essential question what was the iran contra affair i know i talked about it quite a bit and maybe it got complicated you could be as simple as you can if you understand it i hope i explained it well enough i, I mean it 
I understand if I didn't because it's just such a complex thing. But if you can manage to try and keep it simple, you know, who was involved, what was traded, and with what, um, you know, that that should work. Uh, so before I forget, we have a Zoom meeting today at 2 o'clock, and then we will finish the lecture tomorrow. We'll finish the lecture. You'll turn in your essential questions, and then I will – I'll probably assign the study guide tomorrow so you can start on it if you want. And then the study guide and the take-home test both will be assigned – the take-home test all assigned Friday. They will both be due on Wednesday. So I'll give you the whole weekend and then the first three or two and a half days of next week to do it. I really strongly recommend you not put it off. I recommend you try and get those done in a timely fashion. And then you can focus on other classes or if you're done, you're done. Um, but that's going to be our plan. But I'll talk about that tomorrow more in the Zoom meeting that I do want everybody at. So. Uh, with that, I think we're good to go. Thanks for tuning in, guys and guys and gals, and have a terrific day.